All right, everybody, good morning. We are going to jump right into a lecture. Um, <clears throat> moving forward in, in the, the textbook, you know, uh, this textbook is made in such a way you don't have to follow it linearly. You can jump around a little bit. And uh, so I do that a little bit. Uh, we, we're going to go ahead and jump ahead to chapter eight. Okay, we're going to come back and get six and seven um, or whatever we skipped. Um, the big topic on chapter eight is on this concept called arrays. And so it just makes a lot of sense to me, and in many programming books, once you learn loops, the next thing you learn is arrays in a lot of cases because arrays will utilize the repetitiveness of loops. And so a lot of times they kind of go hand in hand. Arrays and loops go hand in hand. So I just, it makes a lot of sense to me to go ahead and lecture on arrays after after the loops section and so with this being said uh, everyone please watch my screen for just a minute and make sure that you're creating because I still know people are not creating the labs in the proper places in their repository okay so I know a lot of people are doing this just fine uh, but a lot of people are still not putting things in the right place um, it is easy to screw this up so I just want to hit this part real quick. So here we are, we're going into chapter eight, and let's just presume that you're doing chapter eight labs. You're gonna start by creating a new project. And whether it's a GUI, which will be a Windows form of the .NET framework or a console, um, I'll just do a console app. The location, really you're changing this to be the folder that you're gonna put it, uh, this is really what I would call a parent folder. Right, the parent folder is either going to be this lab, so it, this you got to just pay attention to this full path. Okay, so where is your repository on your computer? You have to know where your local repo is. Okay, so you always want to pay attention to make sure that this is going into your repository. In my case, this directory right here that I'm highlighting is my local repo, and then the the parent folder then of basically are you doing a lab or are you doing a hands-on test and so if you're doing a hands-on test of course this is going to be the folder that you select since this is a lab this is going to be the folder that I select so you select this folder now the solution name again this is this is what you can do is you can kind of look at here and you can see the different folders now I've got a chapter 5 and I got a chapter 5 part 2 I created chapter 5 part 2 because I wasn't there before Okay, so if you want to create chapter five, part two inside of here, that's fine. Or just make it another solution right here. That's totally fine as well. Okay, but look at the folder name. This is CH08. So again, this is our parent folder lab. This is CH08. Okay, not to belabor this, but here we go. This is just going to keep be called class demo. What this is going to do is put my chapter eight lab in that subfolder click next, create. Okay, what that doesn't do is, you know, create some extra folders that are no longer need, that aren't really needed, they don't follow the convention. So if I go into here, now in my CH08 uh, uh, folder, let me maybe save my files here. Uh, I need to go to here, here, lab CH08 again being in the right path I was in the wrong path for a second so it creates a solution file and that's the file that you open up to see all of your projects for chapter 8 if I actually click on this class demo you can see a project file CS proj that's your project file this CH08 folder is empty um, this is what it creates. Okay, moving on to get into this whole topic is arrays. So we're going to dive right into arrays. I always like to talk about why are, why are these concepts important. Please put the cell phones away. 
Let's focus in here, please. Why are arrays important? Um, in the world of software, we work with a lot of data. Right now, our data is stored in variables. Are you going to be recording this software? Yeah, it's, it's recording. It'll be out on YouTube. Uh, it, let me launch it on Discord so you can see it. Let me do that real quick. Thank you for... Da, 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 da. Okay, you can see this on Discord now if you want to look locally on your laptop. Currently, all of our data is stored in an array, uh, ooh, in variables, in many variables. And so uh, I'll just do like a programming uh, example of something that we did. We had um, string employee one, employee uh, one name, string employee two name, string employee three name, right? And if we had 10 employees, you were doing this. Does this ring a bell for everybody? Does that seem like the most efficient? No, that kind of seems like silly. And then what did we have? We had double employee one salary, double employee two salary, double employee three salary. And then and then we had then we had some raises to calculate, right? So we had double employee one. Raise one. Remember this? Yeah. And you were probably coding this going, man, I'm just creating all these variables. I kind of wonder, is there a better way? And, and it turns out, and it turns out there is. So if you had a thousand employees, can you imagine creating all those 1,000 variables for 1,000 names? Right? That just does that's just not efficient. And so these variables um, aren't the most efficient way of storing lots of data. Now you want to store a single piece of information? Yeah, just throw it in a string, throw it in a double. It's just one piece of information and it's not, it's, it's not much, okay? But when you start working with more data, you want a more efficient structure to store that data. So arrays are the solution to that problem. Arrays by their nature, not only are they efficient like from a coding point of view, so what I'm saying is that arrays are, from a coding perspective, they're efficient, which is true, but they're also efficient in RAM. Like arrays are stored <coughs> in RAM efficiently. Okay, and what that really means is they're kind of stored, in, the variables are stored in uh, like next to one another and like so I imagine RAM is a bunch of addresses like your home has an address and so if you have an array I'm just imagining a street of houses and all of these pieces of data are one house address right next to each other okay whereas if you have variables they can be all over the neighborhood they could be all over the state they could be all over the nation they could just be wherever in RAM right arrays are in uh, whatever you call it con con right next to one another Con, not contextual, con, 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 uh, whatever, huh? Adjacent, adjacent, not conjugate. Adjacent memory locations, thank you. So not only are arrays efficient from a programmatic point of view, that is true. So arrays are efficient programmatically. Arrays are also efficient um, performance for performance 
benefits. Right? So again, arrays are used when you're storing, what are they used for? Arrays are used to store groups of related data. So instead of saying, instead of saying, oh, employee one name, employee two name, employee three name, employee four name, check this out. We're just going to do this. The magic of arrays are with the brackets. So when you see these brackets, that's your alert. That's your sign. Here's your sign. Was that Jeff Foxworthy? Here's your sign. That's an array. When you see these brackets, here's your sign. It's an array. And now I'm going to give a, my array an identifier. called, well, it's plural, it's camel casing, but it's plural, right? I'm going to store multiple employee names. Okay, there's a couple of pieces here. This is both declaring the array and initializing it to have 10 storage units. Basically creating 10 variables in this array. A variable holds a single piece of information, right? Think of it as 10 storage units. Like you rent a storage unit to put your crap in it, right? To put your stuff, right? A single storage unit can store a single piece of information. It's a single, single variable. Okay, so declaring the array and initializing it, that's the equal sign, that's the initialization, to have st 10 storage units. We have not put anybody's name into the array. All we've done is given the array a name and say that it's got 10 spots of storage. That's kind of the first step. Once you've initialized how many storage units it can have, now we can put data into the array. I would say employee names sub zero. I'm going to break this down a little bit. When you see the brackets, here's your sign. This is an array. This is how we put the first employee's name into the array. So these brackets, they confuse beginners because here you're putting in a number that represents how many storage units you have. Now here, this is not representing zero storage units. This is actually saying in, in the first storage unit, put the string John. Notice we're only putting strings here. What if I try and put a number? Do you think that's going to work? No. This is a string array. So you could have double array. You could have string array. You can have, you can have an array of ints. You can have an array of whatever data type. But just notice that unlike JavaScript, JavaScript, you, you could put strings, doubles, floats, charge. You could put it all in one array. This is like, no, it has to be strings. Questions? Yeah, we'll start with Ryan. So, would you be able to like use the convert to? Yeah, we're we're still going to be converting all that. Yes, good question. We'll still be converting data types, just like when you're you're reading out of a text box and putting it into a double. You'll do the same thing, but now our doubles in an array of doubles, and you'll read it out of the text box and put it in storage unit zero, convert it to a double. Does that make sense? Question two, Vinny. Uh, so because we're starting at zero, does that mean we're actually, we actually have 11 uh, things? We Good question. Do? No, because what, the way this will, so position zero is our first unit. Mm -hmm. We're putting information into position zero. That means these units are numbered zero through nine. Ten would break. Okay. In fact, if I do this, I'm not sure that it'll give me a compiler error, but it should give me a runtime error. Check this out. 
unhandled exception, indexed with outside the bounds of the array. There is no storage unit 10. There's only 0 through 9. So it's always 0 through 1 less, 1 less than the number of elements in the array. Right? You with me there? So if there's 100 elements in the array, the indexes are 0 through 99. If there's 10 units, it's 0 through 9. If there's 5 units, it's 0 through 4. If there's 400 units, it's 0 through 399. Yes? Uh, is there a way to like have, so you, you have to have a number there, or could you put like I and then run it like through a loop? We will absolutely do that. That's, that's, that's the next step, okay? But let's just, let's just continue this on. Employee name sub zero, All right? We got a mail there, employee names sub two. You get the idea, right? All the way. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so you literally can just name these. Six, seven, eight, nine. So we're gonna have a lot of Vinnies working at our company. We now have 10 employee names. And you might say, wait a minute, Mr. G, this doesn't really seem much more efficient the way you're coding this. If you've got a thousand employees, there's a thousand lines of code just to put data into your array. Okay, um, which which is true. That's where loops are our friend here. So arrays often work with loops, and and we'll get there. Okay, so so this is declaring the array. This is putting data into the array, and then now we just got to get data back out. Council.writeline employee employee names sub zero. Should print out John, right? Employee names sub zero holds John, and we get John. Employee name sub one, Amel, and then any other employee names should be Vinny, just because that's the copy and paste job that we did. Common mistake is what happens when I put employee name sub 10. Again, index was outside the bounds. You're out of bounds. For our soccer players, football players, you're out of bounds, right? You gotta stay in bounds. That's out of bounds. In bounds is zero through one less than the number of elements in the array. If there's 10 elements, zero through nine. Now, there's kind of a Let's just see what happens if I do a council.write line employee names. That's just the name of the array. And eh, that's no good. That doesn't do anything for us. Um, there's actually something here, kind of like a two string that it's, it's implicitly calling this method called two string. Again, it's not really, that's not really, that's not anything. That's not giving us useful data. Okay, so so you when you when you're pulling data out of an array, you got to use brackets. When you're putting data in, you got to use brackets. John, uh, for the constant law on right line, if you leave that uh, take the zero out, what does print the entire array? So the question is, if we take the zero out, what does it do? Well, that actually gives us a syntax error. Doesn't does not allow it. Good question. Now, what if I want to print out all, okay. What if I want to print out all, uh, I'm, uh, I'll come back to that question. So this is not an efficient way. I, I just wanted to show this of like, hey, declare an array, put data in, and pull data out. Like at its most, at its most basic steps, this is an array, 
Okay, you cannot bring it down any lower level than this. Okay, you understand the benefits of an array? From a programmatic standpoint, we haven't really seen the programmatic benefits yet. Other than not having different variable names, there's one name here. The one name is employee names, but it still seems like a lot of like unnecessary code. So can you make it more efficient? So you might, you might instead do something like this, employee name sub zero. Like if, if, if this were solving a problem, I'd say uh, council dot right line, please enter uh, an employee name. Employee name sub zero equals council dot read line. This kind of looks familiar, right? So now this is getting feedback from the user. Enter an employee name, store that in our array and print it out. So now just taking it one step past where we did, we got Bob, now Bob is spit back to us. Put data in, pull data out. But now it's, now it's getting input from the user, which to Ryan's point, what if they ask for a number, you gotta convert it to a double, all that fun stuff. Okay, well then, you know, even still, this is not very, this is not very efficient. Please enter another employee name. You'd say employee one, right? And then you would say council dot right line employee name sub one. So now we're we're inputting two employee names. You know Bob and Tim, and it spits back out Bob and Tim. So you get the feel for where I'm going here, but it's, again, isn't there something that we learned? Isn't there a tool that's really good at doing repetitive code? Of course, a for loop. For loops are really good at doing simple repetitive tasks, right? So the, the next step of understanding arrays is to understand, hey, sometimes when you're putting data into an array, you could utilize a for loop to put data in. So instead of repeating this code, this is the data input, instead of repeating that 10 times, you just put it inside of a for loop and there you go. And it's the same thing on the data output. When you're pulling data out of an array, just use a for loop. And, and you, don't need to, you don't need to rewrite this code 10 times so if this, this is our data input, like right here, data input, right? And then we said this was our data output. Okay, let's simplify this. We can write one for loop. Check this out. I'm gonna show you the most efficient way. I'm gonna come back to this code right here. I'm just gonna reference it. Okay, we know a for loop, for tab tab. Okay, we got our snippet. For int i, i less than employee names dot length. Let's talk about employee names dot length. If you had to guess, what is the length of employee names? What would you guess? I'm looking, I'm looking right here. Gentlemen, if you had to guess the length of employee names, what would you guess? Stay with me, guys. If you had to guess the length of employee names, what would you guess? Thank you. 10. The length of an array, the length, notice a capital L, okay? The length of an array represents how many elements it stores. So let's talk about this for loop. How many iterations will this for loop have? 10, from zero through nine, right? You can count zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, that's 10 iterations. Now, I is suspiciously like it starts off at zero. It increments to one. It goes up to nine. 
Boy, couldn't we use that somehow? Couldn't we use I? By the way, this is called your subscript. That's, that's pronounced employee names sub zero, subscript zero. So, so the way that arrays utilize loops are with this control variable as the subscript. So check this out. So I'm going to take this line, the, the, this two lines right here. I'm going to say council dot right line, enter employee, uh, uh, enter employee. This will say employee number one, employee one's name. And then comma to get this to say number one. Again, I kind of showed you that trick. You increment it, you increment I by one. So, anyways, this this will say enter employee one's name. And then we'll say employee names sub I starts to count at zero equals council.read line. This for loop is going to loop 10 times and allow us to enter 10 names into our array. And it starts off visually for the end user. Of course, people start their count at one. That's why we plus one, right? Enter employee one's name. And here you can go say Bob, Tim, Jan, Chris, Bill. And I got another Tom, another Tom, another Tom. We got an Evan and uh, Yawn, whatever. Now, this puts in 10 employee names into an array. And then all, well, what's it spitting out? It's spitting out, it's, it's spitting out sub zero and sub one. But using this same approach for, for putting data in, Let's spit it out the same way. For tab tab, I less than employee names dot length. How many elements are in employee names dot length, fellas? Still 10. Great, thank you. Let's spit it out. Council dot right line. Your employees are name your Here's, I'll just do a little council dot right line employee names colon. So we do that one time and this will do a council dot right um, uh, yeah, we'll do right. So we'll do yeah, right line and then we'll just spit out employee names sub I. So again, it starts off at zero, it loops zero through nine, and just prints them out one per, one per line. So data in, data out. We got lots of bobs. Right? Data goes into the array, data comes out of the array. Now we're seeing the programmatic benefit of arrays. There's a performance benefit because they're kind of close to one another in, in RAM, but there's a programmatic benefit and we don't need a thousand variables for a thousand employees. We've got one array that stores a thousand names. All right, now, let's say we've got 10 employee names and we don't know our employee names. So we ask the user for their employee names. Sometimes you know the data that goes into the arrays, right? 
again, it's the, it's the difference between what literal values do you code into the program versus what values do you read into variables from the end user. So there's always, sometimes there's literal values versus user given values. So let's just, let's just say for the sake of this example, I have an array of doubles called employee salaries. I'm gonna show you another way to put data into arrays. And we'll just say every employee makes 40, one, two, three. 40, one, two, three, 40, one, two, three. Uh, brackets, not curlies, JavaScript versus. Uh, hold on, new, I'm, I'm new double 10, 1, 2, 3, 10, 1, 2, 3. Let me get my syntax right on this. Let me get my syntax right on this. If it's cur it's not curlies. Oh, brain fart. Uh, there it goes. No. Oh, it is curlies. It is curlies. Here it is. I thought I did that. Double curlies. That's what I started with. I didn't put my semicolons, all I didn't do. That's what I started with, I just didn't put my semicolon. Okay, now how, how many, if you know the values as you, you know, you don't need to get them from the user, you can code them into literal values in the program. So let's just say, as my example, we've got 10 employees, they all started 40K, doesn't matter their names. 40, one, two, three, 40, one, two, three, 40, one, two, three. Let me make sure I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Let's I don't know, format in some way. Now all my ten employees, okay, here's a, it's a separate array. Yeah, Tyler. Thank you. Okay, now I've got two different arrays. One holds names, one holds salaries. The names I get inputted from the user. The salaries I've coded in literal values. I've just put them, hard code them into the program. So there's a concept here that these two arrays, they're not they're not connected in any way. Uh, but there's, there's, there's a trick. I call it a trick. Maybe it's not a trick. There's a way that you can say, okay, well, couldn't this salary represent the first employee salary? And couldn't this salary represent the second employee salary? So there's often a trick called parallel arrays. And the way that the way that this is viewed is that arrays could be I'll put it in linked together through their subscript. And so you know, maybe not everyone makes 40K. Maybe, maybe this lady makes 50. Maybe this guy makes 30. Maybe this lady makes 100. So like kind of a real company, depending on how good at negotiating your salary. This, this, this person really not that good at negotiating, whatever. They got, they got some people for on the cheap and then this one's really expensive. 
So now you would say employee sub zero earns 40. Employee sub one earns 50. And you could use this same output. And let's check this out. We'll say Bob earns per year. And my output would be employee names sub i, sub zero, sub one, sub two, sub three, sub four, comma, employee salaries sub i. I'm telling you, I promise you, if, if this is the first time you're seeing a raise, you're probably scratching your head going, wait a minute, why is it, what is this i? What is this i? i is just, it represents a number in a loop. So the first time through the loop, i is zero. So employee name sub zero, employee salary sub zero. Then it goes to one, employee name sub one, employee salary sub one. So by, by using loops, you can create these things called parallel arrays. And that way the position zero is like the first employee. You would say employee zero's name, employee zero's salary, employee zero's social security number, employee zero's whatever you may have. Yes, Ryan. That's exactly right. And so you're just linking them together through their subscript, through their, through their position in their array. <sighs> yeah. So Bob earns this. Chris earns that, so on and so forth. And that's the concept of parallel arrays. We've covered a whole lot in 45 minutes. Let's take a pause and take a break. Okay, so we're gonna resume here. <clears throat> you know, to do your labs, these fundamentals is really all, <clears throat> doesn't make your labs easy, but um, you know, there's a lot of concepts that you can kind of dive into deeper with arrays and the book definitely does that but for the purposes of the labs majority of these fundamentals are what you need um, <clears throat> um, and you know as far as the testing is concerned a, an important part of the hands-on test is going to be using loops in conjunction with arrays. And so can you use these two things together um, to solve problems? And so, you know, just to kind of go back to this one real quick, the way this one works is it creates an array with 10 pieces of data in it. This one becomes sub-zero. So this one's posi position zero. This one becomes position one, position two, position three. So this, if you know the data and you could just plug it in a literal value, the syntax to do so is with curly braces. So you got the brackets and the curlies on the other side. Um, so, You know, what if we wanted to find out the average salary? And, and this is kind of a lab that you did, right? You had a bunch of data and you wanted to find the average of a value, right? So right. So let's loop through employee salaries dot length.
total salary plus equals employee salary sub I. So what this is going to do is take total salary and add in employee salary sub zero, 40 the first time through the loop. Then it'll add in 50 the next time through the loop. Then it'll add in 30 the next time through the loop. So it's going to, what is this called? This total salary? What's accumulator. accumulator. Total salaries are accumulator. Right? Then once we're done adding all of our salaries together, let's calculate the average. Average salary equals total salary divided by the length of employees, which is 10. Right? Average salary is total divided by the number that are in there. And then after this, you could do a council.right line. The average salary is... average salary. Now I don't want to hard code 10 names every time this is getting a little tedious. So let's just pretend, um, let's just code these names in here. Let's just do it once. One, two, three, four, Hey, what's up, Bob? Hey, what's up, Bob 2? Bob 2. I had a teacher, we had two Evan, two Evans in one class, and he would call me Evan 2. Oh, man. Oh, I was okay with it. It means you're inferior to the Evan 1. Like, like, if someone called me, like, Vince 2, I'd be like... <laughs> Start calling me that, even though there's no other Vince. No. <laughs> I'm okay with being the underdog, <laughs> even though there's no other Vince. <laughs> oh, that's not nice. I'm okay with being the underdog. Little does my teacher know I'm really Evan One. <laughs> there you go. All right, uh, we got a bunch of hard-coded employees. Therefore, we no longer need the loop where we're asking for employee names. <clears throat> So now we still have, and the average salary, there you go, is 48K per year. Um, what about the max, what about the max salary? Now here's a loop to do the total. Could you not also do max? Let's do max. Double max salary equals double dot min value. Remember how we did this? We said to a really small number. And then inside of this loop, because we're already looping through all the salaries, we'll say if employee salaries sub I is less than, no, is greater than the max, then we reassign max salary to employee salary sub I. It's literally the same lab that you solved, now we're just solving it with an array. And you flip all this stuff for the min salary. Double min salary equals double dot max value. A separate if statement, if employee salary sub I is less than the min, then we reassign the min. Min salary equals employee salary sub I. So now we could say the 
highest paid employee now this is the salary the highest paid employees salary now check this out you might wonder well which employee is that I'll show you a trick on how to do that because that's kind of cool uh, the highest paid employee salary is uh, max salary now this actually because there's a bunch of employees that make 10 so we have not coded like which our loop does not account for that like it's just going to give you 10,000 is the lowest um, that could be accounted for but for right now it would presumably be the first employee that makes the lowest salary the way we have that loop written um, but let's just let's just get this print this out for the lowest paid the lowest paid employee salary is men the highest paid is 150 the lowest paid is 10 the average is 48 so it's really all the same kind of min max average this this is actually normal stuff right so you have a company and the company wants a report on who makes the most money who makes the littlest money who makes the average amount of money you know when you have groups of data you have collections of data they often want to search that data they want to sort that data they want to find out averages and all that kind of fun stuff right so being able to do these kind of basic stats is is useful um, now you know if you want to find out who that is you've got a position the position is I And so you could do something like you could save that position. And so um, string highest paid emp name and you would just save that name here highest paid emp name equals employee names sub i remember parallel arrays so now i've got this variable that's saved the name and now the highest paid employee salary is Bob at that much. So the first one is highest paid emp name. Now this is going to bark and say, hmm, use of unassigned local variable. Well, why is that barking? It's barking because this is only assigned on an if statement. So there could be a case made where this is never assigned, in which case you're trying to use something that you've never assigned. And so you could start it off at null and that or empty string. That way it's always assigned a value and that takes away that error message. The highest paid salary is Evan. Oh, look at that. Evan 2. Evan 2 makes the most. Oh, isn't that ironic? <laughs> Evan 2 times your salary. 
There you go. Yeah, right. <laughs> Be nice. Um, you would follow the same thing for the lowest paid. And you could do the same thing to get all the lowest paid since there's three people that make that 10. You could figure out how to extract that. Yeah. Can you go back to the, the code with the highest paid employee? I'm just yeah. So all, all you're doing is um, declaring that highest paid employee is the employee name that has the most salary? Yeah, because if you think about it, remember we talked about those parallel arrays. Mm -hmm. So Jan earns this, Bob earns this, Tim earns this. So it just updates on, on an as-needed basis? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, can you go back down? To, so it, because it's in that if statement, that's why it, it gets um, put to highest paid employee name because you're using that employee salary's I. Yeah, we're using I as the position. So it have the same position. Right? It have the same position. Okay. That is correct. Well, right. I mean, I each iteration of the loop, I is going to be the same. But this if statement, you know, is only going to be true for different, for the lowest salary as opposed to the highest salary. So, like, I, I could do same thing here. String lowest paid emp name. And then I would just go right into here and say lowest paid emp name equals employee name sub i. Yeah, like the first iteration through the loop, it'll both will be the same person. And then it'll start switching. And then it'll start comparing them, yeah. Yeah, so like if you're imagining this, 40K will be the first, Jan will be the, bo if there's the first time through the loop, Jan's the highest and the lowest. And then Bob comes along and, and Bob is now the highest and Jan will be the lowest. And then Tim comes along, and now Tim's the lowest, and Bob's the highest. So it just, it just compares them one at a time against each other. Yep. Uh, like in JavaScript, can you have uh, empty arrays where it can essentially go on forever? Or Great question. In JavaScript, arrays are dynamic. You could, they could just grow. Not the case here. Not the case in C-sharp. C-sharp, your arrays, once, once you say that array has 10 things in it, it cannot grow to 11. Now, there are ways to make that happen. But if I were to say, you know, there's, there's 10 salaries here. So if I wanted to put in an 11 salary, let's just pretend down here, I wanted to say employee salaries sub 10, that will be out of bounds. In JavaScript, that would work if you remember. JavaScript, it would just grow automatically. And that does not happen in C sharp. So for that reason, you get stuff like this. Um, you get you get what are called partially filled arrays. Partially filled arrays that are like things like this, where you say, and this is not a good thing. I don't know what that is Please even suggesting. <laughs> I don't even understand. Double See what employee <laughs> uh, socials 
equals new double. So we dimension it to be 100. So we've got room for 100 things, but we're only going to put 10 things into it. That's called a partially filled array. It's not a good thing. It's not really a good thing. I would not recommend that. But that's, you know. So what happens, the question is, what happens if you want an 11th employee? Well, if you just, if you, you can come back and just literally hard code it back in. Maybe that's one thing you can do. Now there's 11, like here. Um, it's also a thing to create another, a, a new array and copy the values out of the first into the new one. So you essentially copy the values out of the old into the new one, the new one being a bigger array. So let's just, let's just, let's just go down that path. Like I'll, I'll do that real quick. So I'll make a double new imp salaries equals new double. And let's just say now I've got 20 employees and I want to copy the first 10 values. So I'll say four tab tab less than, I'm going to loop through the first 10. So I'm going to loop through employee salaries dot length. So I'm looping through the first 10 I plus plus. And what this is called, this is a copy uh, function. We're copying the data out of one array into another. So we'll say new emp salaries sub i equals emp employee salaries sub i. So that's going to copy the first pieces, 10 pieces of data out into the new one. And so copy functions, copying arrays, that's kind of how you would do that. You would use a loop to copy the individual pieces of data out. Good question, though. Ah, this for loop right here, where you're looping through an array, you're starting at the first one and you're going through every individual one. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I did a whole lot of stuff here. It's all recorded. You can always come back to the recording. I'm just gonna comment it all out. Cause I, I wanna get it back to something slightly more simple. I'm just going to work with my names. So I'll just bring in my employee names, comment out all this stuff. It's all recorded. You can just come back and look at it. No, I don't want to do that. I want to take my names out. Okay. All right. Looping through your arrays in four tab tab employee names dot length. This is such a common loop where you're looping through every element of an array one element at a time that they make a, f a shorthand for it called the for each. Okay, you saw that in JavaScript. Now, if I use the code snippet, it's really quite interesting what the code snippet does. It, it puts in this keyword var, haven't seen that one, var item in collection. Var is a keyword. Actually, it's a data type very similar to what you were taught not to use in JavaScript, right? Var is the old way of creating variables in JavaScript. Nowadays, we use lets const okay but var item in collection uh, var is our data type so what's our data type of our array string so I'm gonna change var to string string name in employee names This is kind of a shorthand for this. Instead of using the subscripts, like in this loop, you gotta say employee name sub i. 
okay? This loop and this loop do the same thing. But this one uses the subscript to get to the data. This one just says, okay, the first time through this for each loop, name is gonna be Jan. The next time through this loop, name is gonna be Bob. The next time through this loop, name is gonna be Tim. So functionally, this loop and this loop do the same thing. As demonstrated here, questions, yes? Yeah. Well, for each loop, okay, good question. So let's talk about that. One thing about a for each loop is it read only. For each loop is read only. So remember we can use loops to put data in or pull data out. For each loops are only used to pull data out. Okay, so there's no shorthand to put data in. That's the first thing about a for each loop. It's also only looping over one array at a time. So when you were talking about your question is, hey, we got these parallel arrays. Well, we can't really use a for each loop when we're talking about parallel arrays because you're only looping, you're only reading one array at a time here. So these for each loops are shorthand, but they're, they're only used in certain conditions and not really those. Par now if I, you know, if I had a second one, I could have another for each loop and loop through that second one to read the data out of that second one. But I'm not able to like, as I had before, I had double, remember I had employee salaries and I put all these in here. Um, like I, I don't, I don't have a way of getting that here. Does that answer your question? So you can't really use for each loops when you're putting data in. You can also not use for each loops in parallel in that way. So they have some limitations. They're nice because they're a condensed syntax for doing something that you do a lot of. But they're only used in certain cases. They're not used all the time. So that's your for each loop. Again, it's used when you're reading data out and you want to iterate over every element in an array. Like with this loop, what if we didn't what if we didn't want to iterate over every element? Could we not do like i plus plus equals 2? You could do this. And that way we're reading every other employee name. Right, so you get a little bit more control with the regular old school for loop. Um, but this is just such a common thing that is shorthand and it can be used and it's nice in certain situations. Yes? Okay, so can you use name because you're making, you're, you're creating a string name. Can, can you use that in other like, parts of the... No, because uh, the scope of this variable is what you're asking and it's only in here. It's just the scope of the loop. Just within the scope of the loop within that block of code. So if I were to like council right line name here, it's gonna be like, what's name? Okay. So what is name used for? Good question. So what is name exactly? Name is a placeholder to hold one piece of data at a time. The first time through this loop, name holds the first sub zero, Jan. The second time through this loop, it holds position one, Bob. The third time through the loop, name is equal to Tim. So name is just an identifier that holds a different name in this array. Does that make sense? Yep, good. Mm -hmm. 
this is this for each loop is used for every position it automatically goes through every name so if i just if i'm only interested in one name i might not use a loop at all i would just say i would just say employee name sub five or whatever four three whatever it is three right so this for each loop would not be used when i'm only trying to access one piece of data it would only be used when i'm at trying to access all of it Good questions. Thanks for asking. So there's your for each loop. Kind of interesting if you just leave off that string and keep it var. I'll talk about this later. It still works. But for now, since we're looping through an array of strings, let's keep the data types matching. But that's just kind of an interesting, like, what is that all about, var, this var thing? All right, um, I'm gonna kind of um, just reference the slide a little bit versus coding this. I will tell you that with these things called rectangular arrays, I want you to think of a spreadsheet. That's all it is. It's just rows and columns. That's all rectangular array is. And so you can look at this, and you can see a row, right? And so this is row zero. Row zero, row zero, row zero. And this is a column, column zero. And so when you have data that you could put into a spreadsheet, right, instead of, instead of using things like parallel arrays, now we just use parallel arrays in this class. Right? But you could, in theory, use this concept called a rectangular array. So 0, 0 puts it in row 0, column 0. The first number representing the row, the second number representing the column. So this number sub 0, 0, 1 puts a 1 in that position right there. Okay? This is certainly a tool that you could use. Okay? We don't really use it in this class because we use parallel arrays. Okay, so I'm not going to dive deep onto that because it's not going to help you terribly in the lab. Okay. Um, this, this would be row 0. This would be row 1. This would be row 2. So, so what we have here is three rows, two columns. Column zero, column zero, column zero, column one, column one, column one. So they show you how to make um, these things called rectangular arrays. And so they do the same thing. Like, hey, you've got this rectangular array. It's just a, another, it's just an array. And you put data in and you pull data out. Again, we use parallel arrays to solve that problem. You could, in theory, use rectangular arrays instead of parallel arrays. Okay. Um, if you're thinking in the sense of rows and columns, like a perfect rectangle has the same, you know, or has the same number of columns for every row, they have this concept called a jagged array. A jagged array means each row have a different number of columns. So row zero has three columns. Row one has four columns. Row two has two columns. And so it's just this concept that not every row has the same number of columns. That's the concept of what a jagged array is. And so here you can kind of see how to declare. So you start seeing like these multiple brackets here. That's when you're getting into these rectangular arrays. 
When you hear rectangular arrays, I want you to think spreadsheets, rows and columns. Not every spreadsheet has the same number of rows and columns. They can, they can vary in that, and that's what they call jagged. So in this case, row zero has three columns. Row one has four columns. Row two has two columns. And you could use four loops with these rectangular arrays as well. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I didn't, I didn't hit a lot on these rectangular arrays because they solve the same problem that we can solve with parallel arrays. So I just didn't, I didn't code them because, again, it's, they kind of solve the same problem. All right. Moving on into uh, this concept of, well, there's another class. Like, let's, let's go through here, come back to code. There's an array class. Remember the like random class, right? Remember this? Random numbers. Int uh, my random num equals random dot next. And I would say between the values of one and three. <clears throat> this is always confusing, keep in mind says that the number four here is an exclusive upper bound, meaning it does not include the number four, it's exclusive. And then we'll just, you know, uh, council dot right line my random num. This line, line seven is the random class. What we're doing here is creating a random object with a, an identifier called random. So we're calling this thing random. Then we're using our random object to generate a random number. So sometimes when we have a class, we generate an object of that class. Other times, we can use a class, we can use some methods, like this next method. In order to use it, we had to generate an object. Sometimes though, to, to use a method of a class, we don't have to generate an object. Do you remember another class that we learned about that we did not have to generate a uh, an object to use it? We've used a couple of them, so you know there's a few valid answers here. Um, um, yeah, uh, there's 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 a couple examples. I'll just I'll just uh, and you'll realize it as soon as I say it. But um, math dot Pi. Now that's not a method. Math dot. Notice here absolute value. If I just use math dot avs returns the absolute value of a floating point number. Math dot absolute fourteen point thirty two. Council dot right line math dot abs. <laughs> okay. Now I didn't have to generate an object of the math class to use it. Abs is a method. And it performed some functionality for me, but I didn't have to generate an object. So those are the two ways to work with classes. Okay, way number one, you generate an object and then you can use that object. Way number two, you, it's class name dot method name. And if you, if you kind of remember, I called this math class is a utility class, meaning you could just use it. You don't have to generate an object. Okay, another one that we use all the time is convert. Convert dot to double. Hmm. 
right? Convert is also a utility class. We just class name dot method name. That's how we that's how we call it. All right, so there's two ways to do that. There's another utility class called array. A array is kind of more like the math class or the convert class in that we could just say array dot and we get all these methods. We do not have to generate an object. So let's talk about the array class. So here is the array class. Let's take a look at array dot sort employee names. Holy moly. That's nice. Let's take a look. Whoops. Yeah, alpha alphanumerically, right? It'll sort by by letters and numbers. So that's nice. Yeah. That's nice. I will all right. Comes with a caveat. It's not the most efficient algorithm. A lot of these methods, ray dot, let's just, let's just look through these methods. Array dot clear, clears the contents of the array. Okay, maybe you wanna, you wanna delete it? Okay, let's do, copy, that's nice. Maybe we can, maybe we talk about copying data, right? Array dot copy. Array dot reverse. Let's check that out. Um, they're there for you to use, <clears throat> but now it's reverse alphabetical order, right? We sorted them and then we reversed them. We sorted them in order and then we reversed them. <clears throat> Let's take a look. What else we got? Reverse. There's a for each that allows us allows us to kind of do um, another another way of looping uh, through an array. Um, we might use that later on. Uh, da, 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 array. Ooh, what's this? Array .find. searches for an element that matches the conditions defined by the predicate and returns the first the first occurrence within the array. So let's do an array .find. What's the predicate? What is a predicate? Um, yeah. Um, let's just see. Let's just let's just see. Can I pass it? I don't think I can do something simple like that. If I think if I could answer that question, I could probably figure out how to use this array dot find. It's like uh, it's part of the sentence containing a verb, or it's state or assert something about the subject. No, let's see. Um, okay, so let's see how to use this array.find. Uh, let's see. Again, it accepts what's called searches in a moment. Um, There's a reason why I'm not super familiar with this, and that reason is a lot of the times I'm hesitant to use these methods because you can write the functionality yourself, and it oftentimes performs better when you write these things yourself, believe it or not. Um, and so if I were to write, uh, I could write my own find algorithm, I could write my own logic to do a search, because that's what a find does, is it, do it performs a search. And uh, I'm familiar enough with the tools in this class, not just sort and reverse, but you know, there's other ones. And I, 
I will tell you they're not always the most efficient. Like you could write your own logic that would execute faster. Um, yes, sir. Well, for that array dot find, would you just do like a, a, a read line? So it would read uh, whatever. You're like typing whatever they're typing. Goes to the array. Well, um, I mean, so let's pause real quick. Okay, so this is going to be similar to those arrow functions that we were using in JavaScript a little bit. So that's why the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to pass basically what we're searching through. So that's what I was leaving off. We're searching through employee names. Um, comma. So again, so if I look here, this is the array you kind of look here, the find, this T will talk about what that actually is. That's a generic. But the first argument is the array that we're searching through. Now we need to provide the, uh, basically we say where the element arrow element dot starts with a J, so you provide a condition. And this is the string comparison. I'll, I'll get this in one line so it's readable, because right now it's not readable. It's actually And I will store this in a string result equals. Not quite as condensed of a syntax, but maybe maybe it works. Let's do console.write line result. So Jan2 is the first one that it's finding. Again, what did we do? Why is Jan2 the first one? We've sorted it and then reversed it. So Jan2 was coming up first. And that's the syntax for array.find. So that's, this is actually, we're probably going to see this kind of thing again. What does ordinal do? Um. String comparison specifies the culture case and sort rules. So it compares string to string. Yeah, what does capitalization matter? You know, um, different languages have different ways that they might sort. You know, so you sort an, an English name, a Chinese name, yeah, I don't know, you know, uh, a Jap, you know, these different, these different uh, symbols that might come up. So basically, yeah, some of the rules on the sort. Uh, okay, so. Yeah, so this is interesting, the find. This is a very common way to perform a search. Is with a find method. Um, another way that you, you'll see in the book is uh, a binary search. Binary search, the syntax is not so complex. Um, to do the same kind of thing here, we would say string result equals array dot binary search. We're searching employee names, comma, and this is, now this is nice and easy, right? Uh, of course, I say that, and employee names is not null here. Cannot income, 
oh, this is going to return a position. Binary search returns an int. You, can, can you see where it says it returns an int? Binary search returns an int, which would be a position. Int position in the array. And so console.writeline employee names sub position would, ret would retrieve the value that we're looking for. And again, it's going to return the first one because Jan2 is the first one in the list when we reverse it. So this is one way of doing a search. This is another way of doing a search. This way is a more modern approach, although the syntax is not as beginner friendly. Um, this arrow function, uh, this way does provide a little bit more flexibility though, because uh, there's all sorts of starts with, contains, there's all sorts of methods here that you could um, perform, ends with, We'll learn a lot of these throughout the class. So the find method would be a good thing to start to get familiar with. But this binary search also could work. So I've demonstrated binary search, sorting, copying array 1 into array 2, and how many elements. So instead of writing your own for loop to copy elements, you could use this copy. Again, I prefer to write my own loop. Uh, let's see. They demonstrate binary search. Copying arrays, array.copy again. This is OK using this, but I prefer to write my own. Uh, we haven't talked about methods yet, so it doesn't really make sense to talk about 36, but um, methods can return arrays, methods can accept arrays. We'll get into methods. It's a whole big chapter coming up. And I'm going to stop the lecture at this point, and we're going to break it up into two parts because we're about halfway. Okay, this is a really good stopping point from the introduction to arrays here.